Okay, welcome. My name is Sharon Query and I'm the Education Coordinator from Holden Village. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the last in the series of the interfaith webinars that are sponsored by Holden and Paths to Understanding. And it's my pleasure to turn it over to Terry Kylo. And again, a big thanks to you, Terry, for all your work in organizing and scheduling this week. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Sharon. I just want to say it's it's uh, been such a pleasure to work with you these last three or four years, and and uh, we're going to miss you next year, and we we wish you well on your your next endeavors, and uh, well, our our prayers will go with you. Tonight, we're so happy to have for conversation about human beings as as part of the ecosystem. Um, rabbi Johanna Kinberg, who has served as the rabbi of Kolami since uh, 2014, um, welcome, welcome, Johanna. And then also uh, Imam Adam Jamal, who's the Imam at the largest Majid in Washington State, which is the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. Welcome, Adam. And then also Moses Pinomaka, who's the Director of Theological Education for Emerging Ministries at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, which is a part of California Lutheran. Welcome, Moses. And my name is Terry Kylo. I'm the Executive Director of Paths to Understanding. And uh, so, you know, tonight's topic, as, I, as I've already said, is human beings as part of the ecosystem. Um, this last June, temperatures in Siberia reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We are now in a situation where human beings have not only changed the climate through the production of CO2, but the earth has warmed enough now to unleash feedback effects. The tundra is thawing and beginning to decompose, releasing more CO2 and methane, and even more powerful greenhouse gas. Many are caught up in denial that there is a problem at all. Others are trapped in despair that anything can be done. What is the role of human beings within the ecosystem? How do we understand the relationship between human beings and other life on this planet? What kind of changes in behavior, including economic behavior, do our faith traditions suggest in such a crisis? where all the life of, on, the human, human, on this planet uh, is, at, is at peril. These are the, some of the questions we'll be grappling with tonight. And I, I would like to start off uh, tonight, if we could, with, um, with, with, uh, I, with the uh, Imam Adam uh, sharing uh, some things about what Islam might teach about this and other these questions of environment. All right. Um... In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Uh, thank you, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all once again. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I, I'm, I really miss Holden. I really miss that environment. You know, um, I miss that, that wonderful air in the mountains. And I miss the creek and the, uh, the, uh, the taking the naps on the, at, at the shore of the creek and the, <laughs> and that and that cold water when my son jumped into it then I had to jump in after him that was that was a lot of fun um the ice cream after after uh vespers um it was a lot of fun the, the two times that I've been so far and um we're here now in this virtual way and I think when I think of Holden I just think of that pure environment you know almost untouched just that one little area that's touched but other than that this untouched area, and it, it reminds me of it reconnects me because I think when you're when you're when you're in the city, when you're with you know in I guess civilization, normal civilization, you become disconnected from that and from the environment and from nature, and from all of that. And um, going to a place like Holden really reconnects reconnects you with that side and just the fact that you don't have internet right and you can't uh even for staff we have to like go to a hill and then kind of turn our laptop sideways and then we might be able to get internet for about half a second so you know it's um it uh that it was an experience it was definitely an experience and it reminds me of of this topic today as well and there's a connection there i think to the environment and to the faith and to to the experience at holden <clears throat> and uh, some of the things that I wanted to share from my own faith, um, first off, um, in our 
second second chapter of of our holy book, the Quran, which we believe was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, via Gabriel from God, and we believe it's the literal words of God <clears throat> in its original Arabic language. And um, in the second chapter, there is a story in there, I guess, which is similar to Genesis, in that it's the creation of man, the creation of Adam and Eve, uh, uh, the the devil tricking Adam and Eve into eating from the tree, and <clears throat> and so on. Um, that that whole story is there, uh, and before that story begins, um, God tells the angels in the Quran. The story goes that God tells the angels that I'm going to place on the earth my successor. So he uses the word Khalifa, which means successor, and. Uh, the idea behind that, that word is that this creation is God's representative, the one who carries out God's vision for the, for the earth. Uh, and the angels respond, well, are you sure? Because this creation seems to have this, this propensity for war and bloodshed and, and you know, um, causing evil as well. And God says, well, well, I know and you, you don't know. <laughs> I know best. Um, and God shuts that down. And um, he also shows them. He shows them that the difference between man and the angels is that man can learn and man can have knowledge and man can learn all the things, all the different things that God teaches man. Um, and so going back to that word of successor, it's also been translated in some archaic translations as vicegerent. Um, there's this idea of stewardship, this idea that, that the earth for us is um, a trust in Arabic amana. It's a trust that human beings have been given and that when we leave this earth, we should leave it in a way where it is either equal to where it was when we got on this earth or better. And I don't know if we're doing that. Um, the amount of emissions, the amount of, um, um, the amount, the amount of uh, just things like oil spills, um, you know, uh, nuclear waste, all kinds of things, right? It, habitats being destroyed, animals going extinct because of, because of uh, mankind's uh, work or because of mankind's, I guess, uh, I don't know if work is the right word, but because of whatever mankind is doing, um, the, the Quran ex expression is corruption that's being spread throughout the land in sea and on land. Uh, all of that is going against this idea of being a steward, against this idea of being God's successor, of being God's representative on this earth, of carrying out God's vision for this earth. And so there's a few things to support this idea, which I want to share with you all today. Um, the first one is that there is no uh, believer who plants a tree. This is a, a saying of Muhammad, peace be upon him, that no, there is no person who plants a tree or sows a field for a human bird or animal to eat from it, but it shall be reckoned as charity from them. So planting a tree... Uh, Providing that benefit for, for people is something that is an act of charity. Um, he also said that um, to a companion of his who was performing the spiritual wash that takes place before prayers, um, the companion was using lots of water to perform that wash. And mind you, they're in the desert, essentially. Um, and, and so the, the Prophet Muhammad said to him, well, what's with all the extravagance when it comes to the spiritual washing? And this companion of his responded, well, can there really be extravagance when it comes to a, an act of worship? And that's a really profound statement I think that a lot of people have. It's like, well, well, I'm doing something good. It means that I should be able to use whatever, whatever I need to use. And Muhammad said, yes, even if you were on the banks of a flowing river. So when you think of being on, a river, on the banks of a river, you think, oh, I have unlimited water. It's going to keep coming. Uh, just like faucets today, you turn on the faucet, you're like, oh, it just keeps coming. It's, it's not going to stop. Well, actually, even if you have that source of water, you should still be careful uh, in how you conserve that, how you use that, even for something as, 
as uh, normal as that spiritual wash. It doesn't take a whole lot of water. You wash your, in that spiritual wash, we wash our face, we wash our hands, our arms, our feet. Um, and that, that's, that's pretty much it. It's not a whole lot of water, but even in that small act, be careful with how you do it. Um, he also said, do not take any living being as a target. And whoever kills uh, a, a sparrow, a small bird, or anything bigger than that, without a just cause, that God will hold that person accountable for that. And um, someone said, well, what, what if, what, what's a just cause? And he replied that if, you, if you're doing that in order to consume, in order to feed yourself, that's okay. But simply for game purposes, simply as a target, um, that's, not, that's not permissible. That's not allowed. Um, so this idea of not going into extravagance, this idea of not going into waste, this idea of being careful of how we interact with something such as water um, and all of that. And the last thing I'll share with you, um, I don't want to take too much time. Maybe in the second round, I can talk a little more about it. But the, the last thing I want to share with you is, is as, as Muslims, we believe in this concept of day of judgment. So we believe that after we die, um, the world will end one day. We don't know when that day is. And... Um, when that happens, there will be a day of judgment where we are all held accountable for how we lived our lives, whether we were believers or not. So it's not enough to believe. We have to have backed that up with some kind of walking the walk. And um, so Muhammad, he said that even if that moment is happening and you are about to plant a seed, that you should still plant the seed. Even if that moment is, even if you know that, okay, it's all over. Right, like if you knew that, um, <clears throat> I know I know Christians. Uh, I don't know about all Christians, but I know some Christians have the belief of the rapture. Like if you knew the rapture was coming tomorrow, right, or or right now at this moment, and you have that seed, you should still plant it. That's the that's the analogy. That when that when you and so there's this hope that someone has when you plant the seed, that it's going to grow into something. Um, but if doomsday is coming or whatever the term is for it, day of judgment is coming, then you don't really have that hope in that result. But there's this idea of hope and optimism. There's this idea of let me do my part, leave the rest to God. Uh, and just to try to do our utmost that we can and leave the rest uh, to the, in the hands of God. And um, that's a crucial belief for us. And it teaches us hope and optimism and positive thinking. Um, and trying our best to help leave this world a better place than when we than when we came onto it. So that's that's my uh, two cents. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Adam. We, we look forward to more conversation with you about that. And sure. I'm wondering, Moses, if you'd be willing to to share next about human beings within the ecosystem and our responsibilities uh, in it. Yes, uh, thank you, Terry, and thank you, Imam Adam, for your uh, insights. I want to greet you all in the name of the Divine Mother Earth. You know, I grew up in India, and we call Earth as Budevi, that is, Goddess Earth, uh, Goddess Earth as Goddess, or Matru Bhumi, that is, Mother Earth, or Janma Bhumi, which is a birthplace or birth Earth. It's an honor for me to be on this panel and for the reason that we are addressing this issue of uh, we being human beings as part of the ecosystem together, coming from different faith backgrounds, because this is so important and it can be done and it should be done in collaboration. So I am so pleased and I'm filled with gratitude uh, to have this conversation. Um, as uh, we remind ourselves of this important task of how we as humanity are part of uh, the ecosystem and how we need to collaborate to repent, to confess, and to commit ourselves for climate justice and fair care of God's creation. Um, you know, in Christian tradition, on Ansh Wednesday, which is the first day of Lent, we say the prayer, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is an important prayer for me because, you know, ontologically, even though we all are related to the ultimate being, ecologically, we are all related to the Mother Earth. 
we we are count we are from the earth and we return to earth that itself is a cycle and our the purpose of our life is to coexist uh, co-depend and uh, care for uh, the the god's beautiful creation there is a cycle there is an ecosystem that is interconnected and uh, there is that mutual dependency for balance for sustainability for well-being and for keeping abundant life life in its abundance uh, christian scriptures um, and christian tradition calls us to be radically committed to sustaining god's creation um, in in you know we read psalms uh, we read uh, many things from the hebrew bible but the teachings of Jesus, we have number of parables where Jesus uses a lot of uh, metaphors from the agricultural community. Um, and you know, when he compares and the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and from the small seed, a big tree grows so birds can come and nest there. Uh, similar images and he even compares his own death and um, it, you know, our death to the death of a seed. Uh, he says how very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But it, if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life uh, lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it uh, for eternal life. Of course, this isn't as part of the conversation, but uh, how I see is, Oftentimes, we, we, um, we look at the creation to serve us. Um, we even uh, the plants we put in our homes, you know, I love plants. I, I like to have indoor plants. We want the plants to make us happy. Uh, and, but we, we should know that we have the role to take care, not only our plants in, in uh, our homes, but all God's creation. I must also say that uh, when I say confess, uh, Christian understanding has evolved from an understanding of having dominion, having uh, the right to plunder the resources from the earth. It evolved from that to uh, an understanding of stewardship and understanding of being co-creators with God. So there is need for us to confess and uh, repent. Here, I also want to share with you Jesus um, um, doing miracles and healings uh, with all due respect to, to my Jewish siblings. I want to say how uh, it was questioned, it was debated because uh, the community there had certain rituals to respect on Sabbath. But Jesus challenges even that understanding of the rituals um, of observing Sabbath as holy as uh, a time to be co-creators, a time to not just rest, but use that to heal, to do justice, and to take care of God's uh, creation. So he even gives a new meaning uh, to the understanding of Sabbath. I will appreciate if Rabbi uh, Johanna um, shares uh, her understanding of Sabbath. But from my Christian perspective, uh, I appreciate how Jesus uh, looks at Sabbath as uh, a day of rest, uh, but also a day when we remember that we, co we are co-creators with God and we are called to do justice, to bring healing and, and to take care of God's creation. I also want to share uh, that you know, in 2013, the World Council of Churches, which met in Busan in Indonesia, identified eco-theology and climate justice as two of the three priorities for the next working period before the next uh, assembly takes place. So that is actually next year, hopefully, the world WCC will be able to meet. And uh, one of the editors of uh, a, a, a book about um, the, the Busan's um, uh, priorities, uh, Walter, uh, Dietrich Werner, he says issues like eco-theology and climate justice should remain key components in the global pilgrimage of justice and peace. 
in the ongoing post-Busan working period. Since climate change and ecological destruction are getting more and more menacing for humanity, climate issues provide a global challenge which should be reflected also in theological education and formation for worldwide uh, leadership. Now, finally, uh, in this first segment, I want to bring um, how the Holy Father Francis, Pope Francis, uh, released an encyclical letter that is titled, I hope my Latin sounds okay, Laudato Si. Uh, this is on the care for our common home. You know, Laudato Si, me signore. I hope that Latin pronunciation is correct. Quoting from Francis Assisi's uh, Canticle of the Creatures, praise be to you, O, o my Lord. Pope Francis says in this um, encyclical, in the words of this beautiful canticle, I'm quoting from the encyclical, Saint Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. Praise be to you, O my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us, and who produces various fruit with colored flowers and herbs. The encyclical also reads, I will just say a little more, which because it some, some, sums up a lot of uh, Christian understanding. The Pope uh, said, this sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters entitled to plunder her at will. The violence present in our hearts wounded by sin is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. This is why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abundant, abundant and maltreated of all poor. She groans in travail, you know, referring to Romans 8, chapter 8, verses 22, the earth groans in travail. We have forgotten that ourselves are dust of the earth, as I said earlier. Our very bodies are made of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. That's what the encyclical, the first two um, points talk about. It's available online. I encourage uh, the viewers and uh, any, anybody to check that out. And, and finally, one more thing I want to say before I pass on to you, Terry. I am part of a group called Lutherans Restoring Creation. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's, um, it's, an, it's an organization cultivating hope and healing for all. And as part of the faculty as PLTS, uh, Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, I'm very happy we became, we made a covenant with this um, organization, Lutherans Restoring Creation, and became one of the green seminaries uh, through which we are trying to bring awareness to um, for us as faculty and staff and also our students how we can um, we can do um, we can practice climate justice as a spiritual practice we can address the intersections of climate change with racial economic and gender based inequality and articulate biblical, ethical, theological, and spiritual grounding for climate justice. So those are some of my initial thoughts when I think of we as human, humanity as part of the ecosystem. Thank you so much, Moses. And I, I'd be interested uh, now to turn it over to you, Rabbi Johanna, uh, to hear what you have to say about human beings within the ecosystem. Thank you very much. So I love, you know, the story that that Adam told about the 
about the Prophet Muhammad and um, planting the seed even when the end days are right upon. We have a very similar story that says if you're planting a tree and the Messiah is coming towards you, you finish planting the, the tree. So, and I, and I wonder, you know, because those stories come out of a similar environment, that there must have been a strong ethic amongst the people to have that kind of, if that kind of thinking appeared in different communities throughout the world, um, there has to be, you know, it, it gives, it, it's evidence for some sort of collective consciousness that people have about being in, in, in right relationship with the planet. Because we have these cross stories that are just, that basically say the same thing. Um, and they're being said by very religious people, believers, not non-believers, but believers. And even all the more so they're saying, you know, take care of future generations on this planet, you know, do your job now. And I wanted to start with a story um, that comes from around the time of Jesus, maybe a little bit before. Um, this is a story about these two um, competitive houses of study. So they were um, yeshivas or houses of study of the very, very early rabbis. Um, there was the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai, and they always disagreed with each other. They always have the opposite rulings on a similar thing. And so they like, they love to argue. And so the story is that for two and a half years, the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai had an argument. <laughs> they kept on debating this one issue. And the issue was, would it have been better if humanity had not been created than to have been created? So they're, they're having this conversation then. So there's an acknowledgement that human beings are unusually destructive and problematic. And would it have been better for God's creation to not have created human beings? These are the kinds of debates we like to have in our community <laughs> over long periods of time. Um, and so they debated and debated, um, saying better for humanity, one house was saying, than to have been created than to have not been created. And they voted and they decided with Shammai, who said, better that humanity had not been created than been created. They decided it was better, it, should, it would have been better off for all of creation that human beings, this is 2,000 years ago, would not have been created. But they also say, the reality, but human beings were created. So <laughs> what do we do? They said, um, but now that human beings have been created, let us examine our past deeds. And others say, let us search for our future deeds. And so they came to this understanding that it might have been better off had human beings not be created, but we were. So we have to examine our own actions. And we also have to think about our future actions. So 2000 years ago, we had a conversation that we have enormous power to destroy this planet. We have um, a text from the same time period where they write a story about God and taking Adam on a tour of the Garden of Eden. And God led Adam around all the trees of the Garden of Eden and said to Adam, see my works, see how good and praiseworthy they are. And all I have created, I've made it for you. But be mindful that you do not spoil it. Because if you spoil it, no one will come to fix it. And so we remember that this is a one-time deal. Creation's a pretty amazing thing. Very intricate. <laughs> we don't fully understand it. We also remember who earth belongs to in the first place. From Psalm 24, the earth is God's and the fullness thereof, and settle the land and its inhabitants. That we are here as caretakers, inhabitants, but it doesn't belong to us. Therefore, we have to employ certain ethics and qualities when we're in interacting with the planet. And one would be conservation, as, as Adam mentioned, conservation, not wasting, is a very important Jewish value, bal tashkit. Um, and so making an effort not to waste. Also justice and equality, pursuing justice and loving kindness and treating our neighbors the way we want to be treated. Because if you treat your neighbor the way you want to be treated, you're not going to dump toxic chemicals in their backyard. Um, also the value of pikuach nefesh, which means to save a life. 
if we know that we're doing things to this planet, so killing people, we're, we're hurting ourselves and we're allowing other people to be hurt and that's unacceptable, including endangered species. And then a big, uh, something I really enjoy about Judaism is the precautionary principle. We're big into precautions. So this whole COVID thing, like not a single soul has requested us to go back to pray in the synagogue. Like no one, no one wants to go back and pray in the synagogue. People are happy with Zoom. And that comes from actually one of the first places we see this principle is in Deuteronomy 22, when it talks about building a new house, that if you, you have to put a little fence around the roof when you build a house. Because if someone falls off that roof, blood on your hands. So the whole idea of taking precautionary measures. And I think that's sort of where I want to land tonight in terms of our relationship with the environment and ecosystem is that idea as human beings, we are uniquely capable and have been endowed with the wisdom of taking precautionary measures. You know, that the Torah talks about building a barrier fence on your roof as being a holy act. It means you know what could happen. And so therefore it's your responsibility to think things through and think out the process. And then it's your responsibility to implement ways of living so that you do as little harm as possible. And that makes me think about COVID and how, you know, we, we, we talk about environmental issues. We are thinking about global warming and water, but really COVID is also part of that. And that there's something natural happening in our world. Pandemics are part of nature. It's, it's what happens. Um, and how we are interacting with the pandemic in this country is particularly problematic, but I think it also speaks to a particular spiritual ailment amongst our population, probably covering all religious groups, which is the spiritual ailment of lacking humility as an inhabitant of this planet. And that this lack of humility is what is causing our own demise. And so um, as many, we're gonna, you know, we, we could do vaccines and wear masks and precautionary measures of all kinds, but one of the greatest precautionary measures we can take right now is to cultivate humility within ourselves in relationship to the planet and, I mean, and each other and understand that the space we occupy truly so that is what I have to share from, from the Jewish tradition. Oh, I wanted to say about Shabbat. So Shabbat actually is, cons the way we view it is it's giving the earth a day off every week. So if you manage, if you ima imagine that, and every religion could choose their own day, but if each of us took a full day off where we didn't use any natural resources, didn't spend money, didn't pick flowers, didn't to just let the world be, what that would do for our planet. And so Sabbath is this, this way of allowing for renewal. And the way we speak of it is that it gives us the energy then to go out and be God's partners the other six days of the week in co-creating the kind of world we know we can live in. Um, so it's that renewal energy space um, is one of the ways that we understand it. Thank you so much, uh, Johanna. And I've been thinking a lot the last few weeks about this question and thinking through the, 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 the four gospels, uh, gospel writings, which really are, are like um, sermons written to communities, you know, in the first century. And, and the story that keeps popping up into my mind as we, as we consider from the Christian tradition and how we live within the, the, um, the ecosystem is actually the the story of the temptation of Jesus. So, so Jesus joins a a a, a renewal and repentance movement uh, that John the Baptizer was leading, inviting people to come back out to the River Jordan and kind of start anew, sort of like hit hit the hit the reset button about how they're going to live because they'd been living under Roman occupation and the spirituality. Uh, and the spirit of the Roman Empire, which was all about dominating people, about power over people, about um, exploitation of natural resources, exploitation of, of human beings, um, and that, that living in that system, you know, which was very powerful and very pervasive, was kind of overtaking people. And so, you know, John the Baptizer, you know, starts this, this renewal movement, encouraging people to care for each other and to to share their 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 food uh, with each other and to learn to forgive each other for the past wrongs, 
so they could start again, you know, and so Jesus goes and, and he is baptized in this repentance, and then is nearly immediately sent out into the wilderness, and, and in several of the Gospels, there's a, a there's a, a longer story of this, and part of it is after fasting for 40 days, um, you know, which is a, a practice that I've, I've learned from both Judaism and Islam is, is partly about learning to recognize our limits, but also learning to have compassion for those that are hungry, right? So he's been fasting for 40 days. He's near the end of his body's capacity to fast and still stay alive. And then the devil says to him, if you're the son of God, command the stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answers, um, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. And so um, it occurs to me that, that part of the challenge that we're having with respect to human beings and the environment is that, um, is that this is a meaning problem. I think, you know, many folk in the Western world have, have defined our meaning system, not in religious terms or in in spiritual terms or even philosophical terms, but um, at, as, as people who are um, winners and losers, com competitors in a free market economy, and part of what you want to do is grab as many resources as you can and externalize all the problems that you can, all the waste that you can. And that's what it means to be human. Uh, the person with the most toys when they die wins. Um, except we all know that that's not true because we're all losing, especially people of color and poor folk around the world and, and animals and, and plants and our children. And so it occurs to me in this, in this temptation that we're being asked the question right now of what does it actually mean to be human? And, and is it really, is living in this as a competitor in a free market economy, like is that an adequate meaning system for us? And if we're gonna deal with this issue of the creation and how we care for it, we're gonna to have to re reimagine like what it means to be human. Like what, what, what are we doing here? Um, what is it that defines like the meaning and, and, and the, the, the taste of every day? Um, and, and it can't be about our bank account and it certainly can't be about consumerism and it certainly can't be about this kind of competitiveness. The second, um, temptation is the devil takes him up and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil here really is kind of a proxy for the spirit of the Roman empire. Right. And so he says, look, I'll give you all of this glory and all of this authority if you will worship me. And so the temptation then for competitiveness, for looking for glory and recognition and for status is something that I think not only was a temptation for Jesus, but is a temptation for all of us. You know, waiting for the culture to tell us like what, what we've got to do to be recognized as a human being of any value or, um, and I, I think a lot about this right now with respect to people without homes who are often seen as sort of um, economic sinners. And, uh, um, you know, having all this 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 opportunity and yet not doing, uh, not being able to to keep a home and not paying attention at all to the systems and the structures and the income income inequality and wealth inequality that leads to uh, to to people being unhomed along with with the increase in rents and home prices, and so it seems to me that there's a competitiveness uh, in us right now about about uh, living out you know, this, this, this desire to be seen as economically powerful. Um, and the third, the third piece here is, I've, I've, is the, the, the devil takes him to Jerusalem, takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down and God will catch you. And, uh, and Jesus says, uh, you know, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And I hear lots of Christians out there, not usually in the Lutheran church or Episcopal church or Methodist church, but I hear a lot of Christians say, well, you know, God, God said to Moses, uh, I'll never, you know, allow a big flood to happen again, so God will just take care of it. We can do what we want, and God will take care of it. And it isn't that, in fact, uh, testing God and, and denying the very responsibility that, that was, 
was given us as it as it says in the Hebrew scripture to and as as both Imam Johanna and Moses have said to be to be stewards of this this creation which does not uh, belong to you but is entrusted to you for a period of time and I think right now as a as a Christian you know I've been thinking about this these temptations as a way for us to sort of analyze ourselves and say well what what is it about my life? What is it about, about my life I need to change with respect to understanding what it means to be human? Um, how we are may, maybe searching for glory and authority and honor and status and maybe putting God to the test in ways that are actually contributing to the harm of, 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 our, uh, of our earth, which is as Greta Thunberg recently said, I mean, it's, it's the only boat we have. Why are we burning it? Um, which then leads us to, to go back to John the Baptizer in some ways, who was saying that we've got to change. Something needs to happen where we, where we change our behavior. And I, I fundamentally think that this is a meaning issue. And I think, uh, you know, Jesus is, um, Jesus is, in these temptations is seen as, as being faithful to God in the midst of an empire that was calling him to reduce the meaning of being human, to go into competitiveness and to test God instead of engaging our responsibility. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to just open it up to all, all four of us for a minute. Are there any, are there any um, uh, questions or comments we'd like to, to have uh, for each other? right now. Um, so I'll just open it up to all of you to, to engage that. Um, I had a few comments um, that based on what um, the others were saying, I wrote some notes down here. Um, I think when it was brought up about COVID and how that's also our response to COVID is a, is a part of our response to, to, the, to the earth and how we're respecting the earth and that idea I think it was Johanna who mentioned about humility or was it Terry uh, having that humility to realize that this is a, a, f a force from God. This is something that, that we need to respond to appropriately and not think about it in a individual way or in a selfish way, but in a communal and betterment of society way. And, and then we look at the countries that have been able to, to do that. They've been, following directions from experts, right? Like I heard about New Zealand, how it's, it's completely gone there. There's there, they can go out again. Um, that they've taken the social distancing signs down because they've, they've done, they've done their quarantine. Um, and that's because they actually followed expertise. Unfortunately, we live in a time where, you know, we've become, we basically, we're giving too much honor to ignorance that my my ignorance is equal to your expertise your knowledge um i purchased a vacuum cleaner i left a review about it i've now become an expert on vacuum cleaners and we're applying that to something like a pandemic <laughs> that oh well my 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 review on this pandemic is one star i i don't think we need to I don't think I, I give a one star to ma wearing a mask in public. Well, that's not how this works. And even the the Quran talks about um, listening to experts and giving that uh, giving that. <clears throat> there's no if it's a, something that's an act of you know blasphemy. Then yeah, don't follow your leader um, when it comes to that. But if it's just um, you know, something which they are an expert in, then of course you should, you should follow that. Um, and it's, and that's, that's what we're, that's what we're seeing, unfortunately, is, is people are, are refusing to do that. Um, and I think it's a misunderstanding of trust in God, because I've seen people say, well, no, I trust in God. And if I'm, if I'm destined to die, um, if God's destined me to die, then I might as well just do it, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Well, in that case, like my dad says, why don't you just cross a busy street without looking both ways? 
know, if you're so trusting in God's uh, will and your destiny, why don't you, why do you look both ways when you cross the street? Um, it's the same thing. Um, and so I think there, that our response to COVID is, is, is an accurate is an accurate representation of what our belief in God truly is and, and um, our perspective. And I think we do need to take a look as a country into why we're politicizing something that should be uh, apolitical. Well, I really hear, I really hear you know, each of you sort of saying that, um, that the response to COVID is in many respects in a much sh shorter time frame. Um, a mirror for how we're responding to the ecological crisis mm -hmm. it, and it's revealing to us you know in a in a shorter time frame the kind of patterns that we've had with respect to uh, to climate climatological issues which have been which people have been talking about for 50 or 60 years now if not more and so is there is you know so the question is can we learn from this shorter this denial process that's happened for, for so many of us um, can we can we learn about that? Learn from that in a way that helps us help the planet actually be sustained and for life to thrive. I think not only should we learn from it, but as religious leaders, we should also think about what is religion's role in this right now, because we're always interested as religious people in matters of life and death and everything in between. And this is about life and death. And so what is our role now? Um, and what, you know, what is it in, especially relationship to science, because there's, I don't, you know, it's not something that I don't, I don't understand where the break happened, where, where, where there was even the possibility to reject science in the name of religion, but somewhere it happened along the way. And it has become really distorted and extreme that, that science and, um, sort of analytical and systematic thought and procedure and testing and all these things that are science that somehow that's not related to God and to me it seems that it's so related to God if God is all knowledge and all wisdom and we search for for divine truth and understanding we're going to come up with some vaccinations along the way you know that that's that's part of our you know God is all healing you know then then that then we're going to in our search for for understanding and connecting with divinity we're going to discover cure, cures for suffering on a lot of different levels but i mean the good news is that we're in the midst of a lot of suffering so we have a lot of opportunities to be religious right now and connect with God and finding the healing that is so needed. So it, I think we have an we have a a really amazing opportunity as religious leaders to have a role in the healing of our society now. Yeah, and um, thank you both for your, for all of you for the, for your thoughts on COVID. Um, I want to respond to Terry your your um, thoughts about the temptations of Jesus and the questions you raised, um, how, what it means to be fully human. I think that's a very good question uh, when we think of our relationship to ecosystem. Uh, how can we be fully human and real, realize our role in keeping, in being part of the ecosystem and keeping God's creation intact. Um, I think um, I look for both um, all of you to enlighten me, but you know, Adam taken from the earth that has the power, the same way earth has the power to decompose and bring new life. We as human beings um, made little less than angels have the potential to, to take care of God's creation, uh, to care for each other and, and, and not be violent, but uh, take care of um, all life, all life. You know, um, but we, we always have that killer instinct to kill something else, so we live. Um, but I think there is need for us to deep uh, you know, take from our own spiritualities 
the insights uh, to say how we can sustain ourselves uh, with um, the bounty we have in God's creation, not plundering it, not possessing it, not just preserving it for our own self and not care for the rest of the world, but see how we can um, be with grat gratitude, share God's resources so we can coexist. Um, so it, I, I, I want to say how maybe one of the ways that we can be fully human is to be aware of the, the, the harm we are doing to God's creation uh, and see how we can mend our ways, change our ways so we can protect. We, cannot, we don't have to consume, but conserve. We don't have to kill, but to make life to continue. Uh, so you know, you know, uh, I, I really like that question. So some, those, those are some of my thoughts. You know, so, so I've been thinking as you were talking there about how so many of the messages regarding our in, environment and ecosystem are, are pretty much focused on what we're not doing, what we're not doing to protect the, the environment and the future generations and, and the possibility of, of life on the planet. And I, I was, I was that, that drew my attention back to some studies that were done. Uh, there was a study done that, that did advertising around drunk driving in a, in a university town. And in one set of advertising said, uh, you know, don't drink and drive. And what they found was that the rates of drinking and driving went up in that town. Uh, but then in another another town, they, they did another another advertising campaign, which was talking about how normal it was not to drink and drive. And that that all the cool kids don't drink and drive, you know, we, we just don't do it because we care about our life, we care about our neighbors, and this is what it means to be a good human being. And I wonder, I wonder, Johanna, thinking about your question, what... Um, what, what the role of religious leaders can be right now to lift up not just the warnings about what we need to change what, and where we're kind of going wrong, but to lift up a positive, sustaining vision for, for what it means to be a human being so that we can be sustained through the changes we need to make, you know? Um, that's just what was occurring to me as I was hearing all of you. I mean, one vision I had was if we lived in a, in the kind of country we could, we can live in, and we, God willing, will live in shortly, you know, that there would have been a national campaign for safety, and it would have included imams and rabbis and pastors holding hands, wearing masks, co commercials on TV, on the radio, you know, really, I mean, there's, there's such a better way well, to- Not to, holding hands. Not holding hands, shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, not shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder, or you know, waving at each other. But you know, there's there's ways to unify that 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 bring people along, um, so that everybody's doing this, you know, something similar for the greater good. And in congregations, we experience that a lot, where when everybody does their little piece, then we have this very vibrant community. So we know it's doable. The question is, you know, you want, you, you want, you have to be searching for unity and to bring people together, but we're so primed as a country. We have so much amazing, beautiful diversity to sort of show each other, look, people from all backgrounds can come together for the sake of our country. So there's, there is a, there's, 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 there's a vision there. Um, we just need to have the right kind of leadership. And um, I don't know how, I don't know if this is super, I guess it, it is related. Um, so I hope you'll allow me to talk about it, Terry, unless there's something else that you wanted to go in a different direction. Oh, oh no, I'm not going to allow you. No, go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, relating, to, relating to what was said about, um, you know, science coming from God and science being a part of God's knowledge and a part of, how God, I mean, God is the one who created, in our belief that God is the one who created the laws of science and the laws of physics and the laws of nature. Um, and appreciating science is a part of appreciating God. And in, uh, in the Quran, uh, God talks about how nature is 
his sign. Um, and the, plan, the planets and the moon and the sun, their orbit, all of those things are signs of God. And even within ourselves, there are signs of God. The blood cells, the, the human body itself, it, its own miracle. Human consciousness is a, is a miracle. The love between spouses is a miracle and a sign of God. All of those things are signs of God's and, 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 and God. And the, and the word that God uses for those signs is the same word that he uses for verses in the Quran. So some of God's signs are in the verses in his books. And then God's other signs are those that are around us. So there's like an external sign of God. And then there's that internal within the book. And so that external can kind of, can lead us in all different directions. And we've kind of secularized it. We've kind of said there's, there's the worldly knowledge and then there's the religious knowledge. When in fact, it's all just knowledge and it's all with God. Um, uh, I think one of, the, one of the really popular poets nowadays is Rumi, right? And if you go on poetry or, or top Islamic books on Amazon or top poetry books, it's Rumi, right? And Rumi has all kinds of poems about love. And I see, uh, I see people talking about uh, quoting Rumi for love, but Rumi isn't talking about pursuing love of your weekend fling. He's talking about love of God, right? <laughs> and pursuing love of God. And uh, one of his inspirations was Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali was a, uh, I believe it was 12th century or 13th century because um, I have the Islamic years, but I think it was 13th century um, scholar of Islam. And he talked about knowledge uh, in religious terms. And he talked about uh, there being an individual obligation that everyone has that as believers, you have that individual obligation to learn how to pray, to learn how much charity you must give the, the required charity. As Muslims, we have a required amount of charity to give. You have to be able to calculate that. You, you need to know once you reach a certain amount of wealth that this is how much you're going to have to give from it. You, that's an individual obligation. And then there's communal obligations that uh, a community has to have a mosque. There, there has to be a funeral system. So if someone dies, the community has an obligation to, to, to perform the, the rites of the ceremony of burial. Anyway, part of that communal obligation is also that there is an expert in, for example, heart surgery. And if you are that expert, then it becomes your religious obligation to pursue it to its ultimate degree and to make sure that you're available for the society around you. Similarly, when it comes to, to COVID-19 for anything, right, you have to pursue it. it becomes your religious obligation to continue that expertise and to be that, that, that person in the community. And if, you, if your time is up now, then there has to be someone else to, to also take that on. And it becomes a religious obligation. So pursuing that knowledge is that is there's this religious obligation there behind that. Right. Which, which is, which is all about like and Luther, Martin Luther had a beautiful like notion of vocation that, that, that no matter what your, your calling was in the world, like that, that wasn't just like your job. Like that was an expression of, of, of your calling in the world. And so therefore, if you're, if you're the butcher or you're, the, you're, you're, you're making shoes or whatever it is that you're doing, you're a farmer, um, you're, you're a leader in the community, you're a professor, whatever that is, like that's, that, that's wrapped up in your meaning. And the beauty of, 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 of God language, right, of, of the notion of God is that, is that you know, God is... is is infinite therefore god's love is infinite therefore the meaning that that god recognizes in us is also infinite we're not competing for meaning because there's enough there's enough meaning for everyone that's that's part of what i'm hearing in you and i mean i i, I said last year that you know to kind of kind of shift the conversation a little bit that you know the abrahamic traditions have kind of two main you know core beliefs one is to love god and the way I like to say that is to love God more than your tribe and tradition, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then I think that there's a third component that, that I think is, is there, it's, it's all in there, uh, which is to, to manage the economy justly within the limits of the ecosystem. And so I guess one of the questions uh, from Gail, and I, it's something that was, it was on my scribbles here, is, 
is what's the connection between the, the economy and the ecosystem, given the fact that we have both an ecological crisis and a wealth and income inequality crisis and, and emerging like right now, this very moment, homelessness issue that's gonna be, gonna be hitting our country um, and not to mention people around the world. Uh, so, so how do we understand like how to manage an economy justly given the fact that human beings do need things. Like I, I do get hungry and I, I want some yogurt in the morning. And, and um, but, but how, how, do we, how do we conceive of that uh, from within our traditions? I, I saw the question uh, also in the chat uh, about what is God's economy? Uh, I want to address it from very little that I know. Uh, I, I don't think I have the answer, but I will try how economy, ecology, ecumenical, all of those come from the Latin word aikumen, which is uh, the house, the, which is again our mother earth, our home. Our home, of course, is here on this earth and God is our home, of course. But in God's economy, it is living for the moment. New every morning are the mercies of the Lord, right? So living for the moment. Not, it is not an economy based on profit. Now, everybody wants to make a profit by, of course, there are people who are donating masks, but there are so many companies now making masks. Anything you, you know, nurses in California are asking, don't sterilize the masks, we want new masks. But uh, there are companies that want to create um, systems that can say, okay, we can reuse. Uh, there is a recycling issue there, but the nurses want, uh, medical staff want security from the virus. So it's all driven by profit and, uh, and plundering the resources and hoarding it and holding on to it. Then God's economy where it is based on sharing, coexisting and living for the moment, be trusting in God. But um, none of us, we, you know, we are good to talk about that. But I think when it comes to practice, our way uh, where we can live, um, making simple amends, you know, you know, you know, some of us use um, bags instead of to avoid plastic bags. I know a colleague of mine who doesn't want to use microwave, and there are people we make so many. Um, things and prioritize in our life. So we are not cre harming the other. We are not harming the creation, but leading a very simple life and leading with contempt and leading and depending on God and nature. So um, I don't know, maybe we can systematically uh, address this whole question of the, the God's economy, but it, God's economy is definitely based on equality, sharing, loving, and caring. Uh, to sum up, you know, the concrete examples we can apply in each context. So that's how I would like to respond to the, the panelists. Thank you for that question. And, and also you are also raising in that, raising that uh, Terry. I was gonna add that sustainability, I think is part of God's economy. In the Torah, we have laws about how to treat the land and that after every, you know, for every seventh year, you have to let your land, your fields lie fallow um, so that you don't destroy it. But then also on the Jubilee, there's also the release of debt, too. And return in return that there's a that's also part of the sustainability vision. Um, big picture for the economy is release of debt. Um, so and there's also the concept of reparations also in the Torah, you know, that of giving people reparations if you've stolen from them um, or enslaved them. So I think all those three things would also be examples of God's, of God's economy. Um, thanks, Johanna. Thanks, Moses. Um, uh, Johanna, you always seem to like take take the word from my mind. Um, I don't know if it's because we've done this a few times now, <laughs> but um, yeah, I was thinking the same thing as sustainability um, and um, sharing, as Moses said, 
uh, I'm reminded of the tradition of Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, who said that your employees are your brothers and sisters upon whom God has given you authority. So if any of you has another person under them, they should feed them with the like of what one feeds themselves and clothe them with the like of what they wear themselves and do not overburden them with what they cannot bear. And if you do so, then help them with their jobs. Um, so this idea of sharing the burden, sharing the load and not burdening someone with more than what they can handle and putting people in danger of COVID, for example, is, is, is a part of that, isn't it? And um, helping them where, they, where you can to make sure that they are safe, um, giving them a sustainable wage that can make sure that they can eat as you can eat. So you're, you can't be having steak, steak dinners while they are on rice and beans. Um, you can't be clothing yourself with Gucci and Armani and so on and uh, Louis Vuitton or whatever else while, you know, um, they can't even clothe themselves to a basic level. Um, so paying that living wage is important here. Uh, health insurance, right? All of that is important here. Um, the, the prophet, peace be upon him, he also said that uh, there was actually this, 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 uh, he, he said that pay the laborer before, before their sweat dries. So this idea of timely compensation, not delaying compensation, um, even if it hurts to give money, right? It hurts to give money, but not delaying that because of that hurt. Um, so I think I'm going to agree with you guys, the sustainability, sharing, um, making sure that the people that are because we, because part of the the crisis, right? People are rebelling against COVID. Part of it stems from that income inequality. They're not saying that, but they're hurting, right? They're hurting. Their 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 account is hurting. Most Americans don't have five hundred dollars for a, an emergency. And once this CARES Act ends and at the end of July, you know, all kinds of estimates are happening in terms of what's going to go wrong. And that's something to be aware of that, you know, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have food and water and sh basic shelter. If those needs aren't met, then people aren't going to want to follow directions when it comes to masks and following expert advice. Um, I mean, part of it is just politicization, but then the part of it is uh, rooted and stemmed from, from the in income inequality that we face and the many other economic issues that we face. You know, Jesus um, told a, a parable about um, people who were laboring through the day, and some were, were hired early in the morning, some in the mid-morning, some at noon, some in the afternoon, some even in the last hour, and how they were all given this, a daily wage. And the people who came early in the morning were kind of upset that they'd worked all day. Um, but part of the purpose of the economy, I think, in that, in that parable is uh, there's several meanings I think to that parable, but uh, but one of them is that the purpose of the economy is to is to feed people, not to use them as exploited to exploitable labor. And and then of course we have in the in in the the, the book of Acts, um, which is uh, all the disciples holding 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 their their uh, wealth in common. So they can provide for everyone out of the out of the needs, and and it doesn't mean that there can't be you know different businesses or or you know even some competition between businesses. I I think what I sort of sense in the in the gospels is that, and and, and in the spiritual traditions that we're coming from is that there needs to be a baseline of care that is extended to everyone, and then you know from there, then of course people can engage their creativity. And we even have studies that show that that in countries where where uh, a universal business universal uh, basic income is engaged, that work workforce participation is almost the same as it is in the United States because people want to contribute, they want to do their part, they want to have that's part of the meaning and, and the joy of their life is to contribute to their community, uh, even economically. And I I sense so much despair in our country right now about you know, do we really care about each other? I mean, do we really, are we really going to be there for each other or is it just every person for themselves? 
and uh, and I, I think that's a big spiritual question, not just an economic one. And but I, so I'm thinking about the fact that we've got seven billion people on the planet, and we've got 330 million people in the United States. Um, individuals choosing to make you know to to not use paper bags. If enough of us do it, like that's really important. If enough of us conserve, that's important. But what's the role of, of faith in terms of helping to engage us in, in more policy, uh, institutional and structural issues? Not that we should impose our, our, our theology you know, on other people, but what, is, what do our theologies say to us about, about what direction and, and about how to be active in the making of, of the policies that, that have even more impact than our individual actions? I think that when we organize, you know, and come together in this Abrahamic way, I, it's very powerful for me because it makes me realize how much we have in common around certain really important things about life and then how many of us there are, you know, just that there's, that there's a lot of Christians and Jews and Muslims in this country and we have all these other religions too, which are great, that we share stuff with, but we also have this common origin and we all three have ended up in this country that none of us, you know, other than native people, this is not like we, you know, we all came over here one way or the other, except with a few exceptions. So we ended up here in this democracy where citizens have an opportunity to shape the, the laws of the country. That doesn't exist everywhere. And, you know, even in Washington state, you can just get signatures and get stuff dealt with, which is <laughs> really wild. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, I mean, we, 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 what does it mean to be religious people in a country that pro protects religious liberty, but also has a, a citizen participation element to it? And I know it debate maybe it doesn't happen in your congregations, but I know that a lot of Jewish congregations, you know, people are worried about policy making in relationship to religious life. Like maybe that's not our role, that the separation of church and state means we keep our religion here and we don't allow that to influence policy. But I think that that is an, a false way of understanding it. I think that policy is informed by values and our values are often reformed by our religious life. And so we can't separate them. And the, and the values are for about, you know, about highest you know about living highest self and having the best society we can have so when we can come together around common values and make that policy especially when it addresses suffering you know if we have wisdom around addressing suffering and we can do it together i mean that's 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 really pretty holy work that we that people can do together in this world wow Thank you, Rabbi. I, um, uh, you reminded me of the, the Faith Action Network, FAN. Um, and uh, FAN was with us last time when we went to Holden. Um, and I think that was such a new, I think just the name, I think, is great. You know, I love good names. Uh, names that tell you what, what it is about, not an esoteric, weird, you know, philosophy, you know, up in the sky, in the sky, pie in the sky kind of name. But Faith Action Network, it doesn't get anything any better than that. It tells you exactly what it is. It's an action network based around faith. Um, so FAN has been uh, supporting causes um, that come from religious and faith-based values. Um, and I think that's so powerful that these different uh, people from different faiths, all faiths, I think when I went to the FAN dinner, the annual one, I saw people from all groups, Sikhs, Native Americans, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, Muslims, everyone, all together and um, trying to have, trying to push for that change. And we actually went uh, as a group of faith leaders right before COVID, back I think it was in February, we went to Olympia um, just to have our own lobbying day. We met with the governor. We talked to the governor about certain issues, about um, about the about death sentences in, in Washington state, about um, other things that people of faith had um, had something they wanted to talk to. 
uh, uh, officials at, in Olympia about. And I think that was really powerful for us to go and meet with them and also hear from them how they're responding to COVID and how they can uh, use our help in order to respond and to educate and to, to get the word out. Um, so I think just having something like that is powerful and, and joining forces with some something like FAN is, is really crucial. Yeah, I just I think that if we don't grapple with the with the structural uh, policy issues, like you know somebody decided in the 1950s that we weren't going to put money into trains and buses, that we're going to put money into automobiles. Like, like powerful people got together and decided that without really checking in with uh, the society, without thinking through the consequences of it, it just was going to make them a lot of money. The people who and made so the here we are. Right. And so here we are. So, so we, the people in this country, um, you know, have the right and responsibility to engage in that political process. Um, and, and people who say, well, the government, you know, shouldn't decide those things. Well, the government's already decided lots of those things, <laughs> which is why we're doing things the way we're doing right now. And how is that working out for us? Not, not terribly well. So we, we, the people, have the right and responsibility together to engage in that kind of conversation. And I think so often we conceive of politics as dirty in, in a way that, that, that separates us from not just something that's important, but something that is actually an expression of our created responsibility. You know, if we're going to care for it, if you're going to steward the earth, you, 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 you have to take part in the, in the communal process of, of ordering the city, ordering the polis, which, which Debbie on Facebook you know, re reminded us is just, politics is, is taken from the Greek word polis, which is, which is city. How we care for and sustain the city. And I, and I think more people of faith need, need, to, uh, need to engage in that conversation in a humble way, in a learning way. But, but including using some of the values that, that we've learned, you know, in our tradition. Um, so I, I, we're going to try to end about 725 so the rabbi can, can have a few moments before she begins her Shabbat services. Um, but, so I, I just want to kind of end with this, with this question. There's a lot of people who are feeling intense despair about the, the environment. I know, I know some of my family members do. I have a daughter that just sometimes wakes up in the morning feeling anxiety about it. And, and I, I know I do too. I sometimes look at the trees or the, 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 the water and I, and I wonder like what, what's gonna happen to that in 50 years? And I guess I, I, I know that the conversation about denial is like denial and despair and, and how we find hope is really is a really big topic, which could take another hour and a half. But I want to focus this on this: like, how can we enjoy the earth, the creation, knowing that it's in peril? And is it important to do so? Let's say it's in peril, in, in, imperiled. <laughs> Um, by our by human action and neglect and pollution, and just as true of a reality is that every single day creation is renewed, and that's also just as real. So every day creation is renewed, and we see God unfolding, you know, as, as throughout the day. And so that is that's powerful. And so we, you know, we have to also hook into that. That there is, I mean, look, COVID is, you know invisible we don't know how it works um you know the earth's in peril but so are people because we <laughs> you know we're also in peril because we we are seeing that we're also in some ways extremely powerful and also very very weak as a population as humanity and so we we we, we hinge ourselves on what is true and powerful which is that everyday creation is renewed I think uh, there is need for us to collaborate. Um, the communities of faith need to come together. Nations need to come together. The issues that we are facing today can be addressed by a global network. You know, FAN, you would refer to Adam as the network. Uh, religious groups, 
nonprofit organizations, all of us need to join hands to address this. You know, there is, when I look at uh, some of uh, the, the, the documentaries of how um, creation is taken care by um, raising resources, by preserving forests and you know, natural reserves, uh, there is some work done, but that's not sufficient because when we have calamities um, or pandemics like this, it is the poor who suffer a lot. It is the people of color who suffer. And of course, it, these things happen and all of us suffer, but it is those people who are on the margins that suffer. So there is so much need as been already voiced uh, for us to join hands together and work together. Thank you. So Adam, any, any final words from you, brother? Um, I just want to thank everyone for being here, for, for, for being with us today and to discuss this very important topic. Um, I think it's really about our relevance, our faith, the relevance of our faith to, to what's happening around us. And I think exercising that intellectual reflection, I think is very important um, to realize that religion does have a place here and can help us to, um, to, to help us to make the change that we want to see. And if all the, if we all say that politics is dirty and all the pure people, the pure people, if they all leave politics, then yes, it will be dirty. Um, <laughs> but if we all participate, then we can change, change what's happening. Thank you so much. And I, I, I just think it's important to, and I actually was going back to something that you said, Rabbi Johanna, last year that, that, you know, the earth is meant, you know, it's meant to be savored. You know, the, 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 we eat the fruit, you know, it's that, that moment of that, that, that beautiful taste you know, is a blessing, is a sign of the creation as a blessing. And, that, and that's been working on me all year. Um, as, I, as I've been thinking about these moments when I have the sense of despair. Uh, but then I also, I, I have to set that aside and look at the beauty of what's in front of me. Not just the potential loss of, 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 of what's in front of me. And that doesn't diminish my need or my responsibility to, um, to work for its its healing and wholeness, it actually empowers it and, and, and energizes it. And I just, I want to thank you for, for saying that last year. I don't know if you remember saying something like that, but, but that, uh, that's, that's meant a lot to me this last year. Um, as I've been, as I've been reflecting, uh, on, on today. Um, so at, uh, Imam Adam is going to share a brief prayer and blessing. We'll have a few words of, of farewell and, uh, and so, Imam, go ahead and, and, and share a word of blessing with us. Sure. I begin with the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate, who we call upon by many, many names. Dear God, we thank you, we praise you, and sanctify your name for all that we have, for a roof over our heads, food in our bellies, and water to quench our thirst. Dear God, we pray for peace and not war, righteousness, not irreverence, for justice, not tyranny, for love, not hatred. We pray for compassion, not cruelty, for faithfulness, not hopelessness, for trust, not betrayal. We pray for good deeds that match what we preach. We seek your protection from the wrong kind of speech. We seek your guidance in our pursuit of justice and compassion. We seek your help to be good stewards of this world that you have fashioned for us, the earth which you have blessed us with. Let us be kind and gentle to every living being and protect those who are weaker than ourselves. We wish to think pure and beautiful thoughts, say pure and beautiful things, and do pure and beautiful deeds. Give us hope for a better world and help us to be the change that we wish to see. Give us the serenity to accept the things which we cannot change, the courage to change the things that we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Dear God, show us the truth as the truth and help us to act on it and defend it. Show us falsehood as false and help us to avoid it and protect ourselves against it. Amen. Oh, Amen. So I want to thank again each of you, Moses and Johanna and Adam, uh, for, for sharing with us this week. For Bethany, who also shared with us on Monday, um, but was busy with childcare needs and uh, family needs this week. 
Um, and thankful to all the other panelists, uh, Rainer and Reiner, and also Amina, who shared with us art this week. And then I want everyone to know that on Paths to Understanding website, there's a there's a page for Holden Interfaith Week, and we have links to six videos that were prepared before Holden Interfaith, and we'll soon have the links to all these videos and podcasts uh, available to you, so you can pass them on to friends. Um, thanks to Gisela for for attending, to all of you that attended this week. We look forward to seeing you all next year at Holden Village, and we 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 uh, we also thank uh, Sharon again for her excellent leadership uh, these last years, and also to Chuck and Peg, um, who uh, did a great job of helping Holden get restarted again. And we know that they're heading out uh, to new adventures, uh, and we wish that we could all be there at Holden this year to send them out um, the way that they sent out so many of us uh, to recognize uh, the beauty of the journey. And so we wish uh, the, the blessing of, of uh, a new journey to them and, of course, to each of you. Uh, thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you next year. Next year. Bye. Bye. Bye.